Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well today. It is a Friday. So, you know, everybody should be working from home. Hopefully, everybody's staying safe, staying well. This week, we've been talking about the end of World War I, and we're trying to wrap up this unit. Um, we've talked about Wilson's 14 points uh, Tuesday or Wednesday and Thursday. We went over the different aspects of the 14 points, and one of the key points that Woodrow Wilson wanted was he wanted this coalition of multiple nations that would work together in mutual aid to prevent something like World War I from ever happening again. And so what ended up, what ended up forming following the Treaty of Versailles, that, that was the peace treaty that was signed between Germany and the other uh, allied powers, was uh, this League of Nations. The thing about the League of Nations, though, is that the United States actually never even ends up joining it. So you have Woodrow Wilson, who is the chief person trying to make this happen. And, and if you think about, you know, like politics today, we think of the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives actually almost like a rubber stamp for the president in a lot of cases, especially when it comes to foreign diplomacy. But what we see here with the League of Nations is that you actually have a Senate that opposes joining the League of Nations under a variety of reasons, some of them possibly legit and others maybe not as much. So what we're doing today, our central historical question, is why did senators oppose joining the League of Nations in 1919. So we're going to be looking at a variety of documents. So first, I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint here that I wanted to go over with you guys. And I know it's kind of dark. I've got it, it, it just makes it easier to see this board. So I kind of look like a shadow. Maybe that's better for you if you don't have to see me. So the first thing you've got here is an armistice celebration by the American Red Cross workers in Paris 1918. Uh, by the fall of 1918, the German army realized that their hopes of winning the Great War were slim, and German leaders agreed to surrender. On November 11th, 1918, Germany and the, and the Allies signed an armistice, which is an agreement to stop fighting. Although the fighting had ceased, the two sides had yet to sign a formal peace treaty ending the war. Some of the Allies, especially France and Britain, wanted a peace treaty that would punish Germany for the war. They especially wanted Germany to accept blame and to pay enormous reparations. Now, if you remember, that was something that Wilson was cognizant of before the war before the U.S. actually got involved with the war, he knew that some of these sides were wanting to basically punish Germany for starting the war, even though, like, we even what, what we even discovered that it may not have actually been Germany's fault. It just depends on what perspective you have. There's, there's a lot of blame that goes around for the start of World War I, but France and Britain, because of the death toll and how much destruction they had endured, uh, at the hands of the Germans. They wanted Germany to pay the full price so this, this, something like this would never happen again. It's a little bit of, that's what we call foreshadowing in the business. So, President Wilson had a different vision for peace than Britain or France. Wilson wanted a peace without victory, meaning that no nation would be forced to take the blame or be punished for the war. Wilson also had an idealistic vision for how to use the peace treaty to prevent future wars, which he laid out in his 14 points, like we talked about, um, address to Congress. Central to his vision was the establishment of a League of Nations, an international organization that would help protect peace by providing a forum for resolving international disputes. And here's his notes here, and I'm telling you, I cannot read these things at all. I mean, like, I don't even think he's writing words. This looks like some kind of Egyptian hieroglyph, or I don't know. I can't read it at all. I guess he could read it. I guess that's what's important. I know it says Brest Litovsk right here, which he's talking about um, the treaty that the Russians signed with Germany to get Russia out of the war. But I don't know what the rest of it says. That's the only words I can make out. He may have just been scribbling. So, leaders from around the world met in Versailles, France, which used to be, if you, if you had me for world history last year, you know that was the uh, palace of Louis XIV and Louis XVI, which eventually Louis XVI was killed. But anyway, um, 
To negotiate a peace treaty in the summer of 1919, although many nations were in attendance, it was France, England, Italy, and the United States that had the power to dictate the terms of peace. European leaders resisted most of Wilson's ideas and insisted that the treaty punish Germany by including sev severe reparations that would cripple the German economy. And it did. Absolutely, it did. The Allied leaders did, however, agree to establish a League of Nations. This new organization included a general assembly of all member states and an executive council comprising the world's most powerful nations. The executive council was given the power to create a court that would manage disputes between nations. As part of membership in the League, each member nation was expected to reduce its military to only what was needed for self-defense and to submit any conflicts with other members, member states to arbitration by the League before going to war. So, on the surface, it sounds reasonable, right, that, 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 that these will work together, you'll limit your military, because we, we talked about militarism being one of the main reasons of World War I, so a lot of these people viewed having standing armies um, as a problem and being one of the reasons why the war actually started in itself. So, President Wilson signed the Treaty of Versailles, but the Constitution requires treaties to be approved by two-thirds of the Senate to become law. Wilson faced a tough political battle when he returned from Paris. Some senators were vehemently opposed to the treaty. A group of 12 to 18 senators who became known as irreconcilables opposed the treaty at all costs. Other senators were willing to negotiate on the treaty, but were concerned about the terms of the agreement for the League of Nations. These senators, led by Henry Cabot Lodge from Massachusetts, became known as reservationists because they would only agree to the treaty if it included certain reservations that addressed aspects of the treaty that they didn't like. I should probably... Here we go. Now you can see it a little better. <clears throat> So Article 10 of the League Covenant said that the members of the League undertake to respect and preserve as against external aggression the territorial integrity and existing political independence of all members of the League. I'll slide this over a little bit so you can see it a little better. There you go. So the members of the League undertake to respect and preserve as against external aggression the territorial integrity and existing political independence of all members of the league. So, hmm, interesting. The interesting part here being the existing political independence of all members of the league, um, as well as respect to, to external aggression to the territorial integrity. So basically the idea being that you would not lose any land. Seems pretty straightforward though. So Wilson's battle with the Senate. Uh, had Wilson been willing to compromise with the reservationists on the language of the treaty, it would likely have passed. However, he was unwilling to make even small symbolic changes. Rather than compromise, Wilson went on a nationwide speaker tour, speaking tour to drum up support for the treaty. However, Wilson fell ill during the tour and returned to Washington, D.C., where he suffered a debilitating stroke that would leave him physically and mentally impaired for the rest of the presidency. Wilson was never able to muster the political capital needed to bend the Senate to his will. The Senate voted on the treaty three times during the remainder of Wilson's final term in office, rejecting it each time. The Treaty of Versailles was never ratified by the Senate, and the United States never joined the other 63 nations in the League of Nations. Here he is speaking to 50,000 people. One thing about Wilson, and you know, I just said that he wasn't willing to compromise. If you study Wilson very much at all, and, and I'm sure that most of you may not go to school to be historians, but either way, um, that's kind of the way that Wilson viewed the world. He was not one to compromise because he viewed himself as being almost above reproach, that if he felt like he was doing something that was in America's best interest, that that was just the right way to go. One, um, I can't remember if it was King George V, some member of uh, the Allies that was there with Wilson in Versailles during the signing of the Treaty of Versailles said that um, that he seemed to kind of view himself like he was Jesus, 
basically. And there's a lot of people who feel like Wilson did see the world that way. He was not much for compromise, as we've seen with the Sedition Acts, um, the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Wilson was very much against any public uh, speaking against the war and against him personally. And he kind of had some, he kind of had thin skin. Like he things really got to him. And so whenever these senators start talking like they're not going to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, it really bugged him. So again, our question today, though, is why did the senators oppose joining the League of Nations in 1919? Was it for legitimate reasons? Did they oppose it under the grounds that it was unconstitutional? Did they think that it was maybe not necessarily in the best interest of the United States for whatever reason, or is it more based than that? Is it more based on political affiliation, kind of like something we would recognize today? Are they trying to prevent Wilson from getting a, a win because at the time he was a Democrat, whereas uh, most of the members or a lot of the members of Congress were Republicans? That's our question for today. That's what we're going to be looking at. So, You go to week 20 Friday slash weekend, the League of Nations. Um, that's where your assignment's going to be. We'll go ahead and pull it up. Let's see, we already have it. Oh. Okay, so you've got five documents here. And you've got a pair of questions that go with each document. You got two for each one. Then at the end, you have an essay to write. Now, a lot of you, for whatever reason, whenever you see an essay at the end, you assume that I mean that you don't have to do it. And it is true that sometimes I have let you get by with that. But I want you to I want you to form a thesis. I want you to write why you think this happened. Why, based on the evidence that you have here. So I want you to go ahead and start off by reading document A and answering the two questions that go along with document A. I want you to pause this video and go answer the questions for document A and then come back to me and I will walk you through document A. Okay, so take a minute, go ahead and read that, answer the questions, and then come back. I'll wait for you. Just go ahead, just go ahead and hit pause there. Yep. Just hit pause. Put me on mute for a minute. Or, or pause. I guess you wouldn't put me on mute because you wouldn't know that I was talking to you. Just pause me. Go over there and do it. Just just go ahead. Okay. All right. Welcome back. So we're looking at document A. This is from Senator Henry Cabot Lodge who is a big figure in American history. Um, he never became president, but he still had a big role in American history between or the end of the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, this is the following from an address delivered by a Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge on February 28, 1919. Uh, Lodge considered himself a reservationist. Remember, he's the one that's not completely against it, but he's not really for it either. Um, and he was the leader of the Republicans in the Senate at the time. So this guy, think of him kind of like Mitch McConnell. So this is what he said. By ratifying the Treaty of Versailles, we abandoned entirely the policy laid down by Washington in his farewell address. Down at the bottom, you'll see there's a vocabulary term. Uh, and that just refers to, we actually read this way back um, when we were going over Manifest Destiny. Um, about um, avoiding entangling alliances um, that uh, Washington had, had, had said from his farewell speech. Um, and the Monroe Doctrine, which, remember, that was James Monroe, who warned against European advances in, in South America. Uh, Washington declared against permanent alliances. Now the Washington policy is to be entirely laid aside, and we are to enter upon a permanent and in this dissoluble alliance. Let us not overlook the profound gravity of this step. So you're looking for four reasons why uh, Henry Cabot Lodge was against joining um, this war effort. Number one is alliances. 
don't know if you can see where I wrote a line. It says, let me, let me redo that. So number one, as he says here, is the alliances. This permanent and indissoluble alliance. Here, that's, a, that's his first reason. So basically he's saying we're going to go back on what George Washington said. He said not to get involved in any alliances, and now you're saying get involved in alliances. So not a big fan of that is, is, is Henry Cabot Lodge, or so he says. If we put aside forever the Washington policy, we must always remember that it carries with it the Monroe Doctrine. Europe will have the right to take part in the settlement of all American questions. Europe and Asia are to take part in policing the American continent. So all of a sudden, you know, at the bottom of your page, also in the documentary, it says the Monroe Doctrine, which was a statement by James Monroe warning European nations against taking territory in North or South America. So now he's saying that this is going to allow Europe to take part in policing the American continent. So, you know, number two here is right here. There is no need of arguing whether this is to be. Force behind this league. Or there's no reason, need of arguing whether this is to be forced behind this league. It is there in Articles 10, absolutely and entirely, by the mere fact of the guarantees. The ranks of the armies and the fleet and the navy made necessary by such pledges are to be filled and manned by the sons, husbands, and brothers of the American people. So, you know, this basically says, you know, this section here, number three in our four arguments is that, you know, the United States had never actually had much of a standing army, just enough to defend itself. But now as joining the League of Nations, you know, in order, they might have to actually raise the, the amount of Navy men and Army men that they have um, in, the, in their standing army in order to kind of come in line with the other, other members of the League of Nations so that if a member is attacked, that the United States can go and help them. So... You know, that's, that's this last sentence especially. We now in this draft bind ourselves to submit every possible international dispute or difference either to the league court or to the control of the executive council of the league. That includes immigration, a very live question. To take a single example, are we ready to give to the other nations the power to say who shall come into the United States? If we accept this plan for a league, this is precisely what we promised to do. So number four... Um, Lodge basically takes issue with this idea of immigration. That as a part of being a member of the League of Nations, that, that means that we may have to take immigrants that we don't want. And, you know, he's not really saying it. There's a couple of documents that we'll see in a minute. Um, but really, he's talking especially about people like the Chinese, Japanese, and others. Remember, we've talked about Chinese exclusion. Those Chinese exclusion laws are still on the books at this point in history. Um, they're also talking about Europeans. We've talked about people who are anti-immigrant, anti-immigration, and want to limit or filter out immigrants here to the United States. So those are those are four reasons. You may find another one, um, but those are four that you could definitely definitely add there. Okay, so that's document A. And it should be noted, you know, I'm not going to answer each of those questions that are on that page for you, but I will say that it's important to note, if, you, if you're wondering, you know, what kind of standing Henry Cabot Lodge has in the Senate, he is the leader of the Republicans at the time. So what he says carries a lot of weight. It doesn't mean all Republicans agree with him, but a lot of them will fall in line with whatever he says as the leader of the Republican Party. Now let's go on to document B. Just in case you wonder if uh, senators these days having the, the backbone of a jellyfish is something that uh, has just recently been, uh, you know, something that happens here in the United States or if it's been going on for a long time, you will see that there is a lot of flip-flopping that goes on in the Senate, even in 1915. So this, this speech was before the end of World War I or before the United States even got involved in World War I. This is a speech that Lodge made 
uh, to the Union College on June 9, 1915, four years before his speech that we just read. At the time, some leaders in the Republican Party supported a League of Nations to ensure international peace, including powerful former presidents Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. At the time, President Wilson did not publicly support the idea, and other powerful Democrats opposed it. So, hmm, I wonder, if you're a Republican and Democrats oppose an idea, what side are you going to be on? Well, let's just see what Henry Cabot Lodge said. He said, what can we do in the larger sense toward securing and maintaining the peace of the world? Nations must unite in order to preserve peace and order. Look at that. I mean, we just read what he said in 1919, you know, four years after this. Look at this. He just said that. That's totally against what he just said in 1919. The great nations must be so united as to be able to say in any single country, you must not go to war, and they can also say that effectively when the country considering war knows that the force which the United Nations put, placed behind peace is irresistible. I mean, come on, man. You know, this was before the internet age, so, you know, people weren't necessarily just hit with sound bites all the time of you saying the exact thing that you are now against. But that's basically what's just happened to Senator Lodge here. That he is basically taking, in 1919, he is taking the reverse position that he took in 1915. So what in the world changed? Why did you decide to do that? That's a good question. Make sure you answer the two questions I've got for document B, but then let, let's consider document C. So this one's not one that we have to read, but this was compiled by historian John Milton Cooper. The column on the far right shows the percentage of votes cast in the Senate that supported President Wilson's policies on the Treaty of Versailles. The column second from the right shows the percentage of senators in each region who were Republican. So if we look at the Northeast, you'll see how many of those senators were Republican? 85%. How many supported Wilson with their vote? 27. That's not very high. And that, there again, you have that Republican rep versus them dilemma there. Next, you have in the South, there are no senators who are Republican and 90% support for Wilson. Now, Wilson was from Virginia, so he was a Southerner, but again, we see a breakdown by party line, right? And we continue on, the Midwest, 85% Republican, only 31% support. Then in the West, you have 50% Republican, so you've got 65%, but remember, you have 50% who are Democrat, so there's still more support um, from the people out West. So again, we see you know a heavy breakdown between Republicans and Democrats. Now it's not quite like we see today. I mean, today anytime there's a vote, it just seems like it just completely goes right down party lines with hardly any crossover. There is crossover happening, but not very much. It's pretty much just a breakdown by uh, party representation. And it's important to remember that Woodrow Wilson had won a second term, um, and the Democrats had been in the ascendant. But I think Republicans may have saw an opportunity here to kind of get back in the game, which they would following uh, Wilson uh, exiting the scene. So here's another uh, senator. This, this one is a guy who was considered an irreconcilable. Uh, that means he was not going to budge one way or the other. Uh, or he wasn't going to budge towards Wilson at all. He was completely against Wilson. So here's what he had to say in 1919. Uh, the real object of Article 10 is to maintain the world supremacy of the British Empire. It is there to stifle the cry of freedom from Ireland. It is there to keep in subjection the 400 million of people in India. By its terms, we are bound to turn a deaf ear to the struggling cry of freedom, no matter from what part of the world it may come. And we may mortgage thereby the lifeblood of unborn American boys to stifle this cry and uphold the cruel aristocratic reign of greedy kings and pagan monarchs the world over. So, this is a real um, this is a real critique 
of the Treaty of Versailles. And I think he's right on a lot of cases. Now, the 14 points in the Treaty of Versailles is going to give some countries the option um, or the ability to have popular sovereignty. But it does not apply to places controlled by the British Empire. Um, and, you know, as we see throughout the 1900s and the later 1900s, as we come through something that we call today decolonization, where the British Empire and the French Empire and others are going to start breaking up, um, you know, those things could have been avoided if Great Britain and France would have decided to willingly give members um, you know, of their own empire, the ability to decide for themselves what, um, you know, what national or, you know, to have popular sovereignty and be able to have their own form of government. And he mentions specifically people in India and people in Ireland, because although people in Turkey and the Ottoman Empire and parts of the Austria, Austro-Hungarian Empire are going to be able to have their own popular sovereignty, uh, people in Ireland and India, places controlled still by the British Empire, are not. So you know, I would I would say if I was if I was grading this critique of the Treaty of Versailles, I would say that George Norris has a point, um, maybe even even a better point than Henry Cabot Lodge, in some ways. These are these are um, these are true. Now, um, whether he's just taking whether he's just kind of taking that point, you know, just because Wilson. Um, you know, as a Democrat, you know, that could be up for debate. But still, I mean, it's an interesting perspective, and he's not wrong about what he says. Because, like I said, Article 10 maintains territorial, um, you know, the territorial integrity of, different, of, the, of the countries of the world. So India, Ireland, Australia, Canada, other places throughout the world that are in British hands. Um, Indochina, parts of, of what we would consider Tha or Thailand, Vietnam will remain French, and that's going to be a big problem later on. Because one of the guys who uh, one of the guys who actually goes to the tree or to Versailles to try to um, you know to try to take President Wilson up on his calls for popular sovereignty is a man named Ho Chi Minh, who you may know or you may not know. He's generally called Charlie um, by Americans because he is the guy who actually... He's the guy that actually organizes um, the Vietnamese revolt against the French and then eventually the United States to try to get, um, to try to get an independent... Vietnam. He is a young man at this point. He goes to Wilson to try to get freedom for the Vietnamese, and Wilson just kind of turns him down because the French were allies to the United States, and the rules of the Treaty of Versailles for popular sovereignty did not extend to those uh, people who lived in lands controlled by the British and the French. So moving on to our last document, Senator Hiram Johnson. Uh, this was delivered on June the 2nd, 1919. Johnson, again, is one of those irreconcilables who strongly opposed U.S. involvement in international conflicts and organizations. Oops. Okay, here we go. Let's just go ahead and open this. We can't hear you that way. Maybe we can view it a little bit easier. Should let it load. Here we go. So we're looking at Hiram Johnson here. Went the wrong way. So this is what he said. It is absolutely clear that questions like immigration, those arriving from the alien land law of California, and similar matters will be within the jurisdiction of the league. As a Californian, I am not willing to submit any race problems we may have to the jurisdiction of the Council of the League of Nations nor the League itself. So that's interesting. So his interpretation 
of the League of Nations is that their racist uh, immigration laws may come under the, the um, specter of the Council of the League of Nations and maybe even force them to change it. And he doesn't want to. Now, the, the, your article or your, your uh, document there says that it's talking about specifically keeping Japanese immigrants from owning land. But, I mean, again, also, you see, he says similar matters. You know, that, that to me, that means Chinese exclusion. So on top of um, the Japanese not being able to hold land, you also have Chinese exclusion. You also have Mexican repatriation. Um, and he's going to make a point here in a second. Uh, I am unwilling that either body should pass upon possibly the gravest questions that confront us. You, gentlemen from the South, or mostly Democrats, would resent the suggestion that a race problem of yours should be decided by nations bound to the race affected by secret treaties. Interesting that uh, you would not like a race problem of yours to be decided by nations bound to the race affected by secret treaties. Almost like, hey, our treaties, you know, if we bring the Japanese into this League of Nations, which the Japanese were on the side of the Allies in World War One, um, and the Chinese into this, this section, then we may have to change our racist laws. And then he looks at the South and he's basically like, how would you like us to have to change black codes because we're making secret treaties with African nations? I mean, that, that's his argument in a sense that, that you know, the, the, basically the Treaty of Versailles in a nutshell is not going to allow us to maintain our racial apartheid here in this country. And I don't like that is what he's, is what he's arguing. So, interesting to say the least. Now, I will say this about the Treaty of Versailles. There are real reasons why the U.S. shouldn't have got involved. Um, reasons that haven't been really touched on in these five, three documents, because I think these three documents, or these five, mostly want to kind of get you thinking about, you know, what real motivations may have existed in American politics. But just from an international standpoint, the Treaty of Versailles was so harsh against the Germans that, you know, there's, there's the famous saying that um, a member of the U.S. Congress stood up and said that this was not a peace treaty, this is a 20-year armistice. And he was absolutely right. 20 years later, because of the problems with the Treaty of Versailles, the world would be at war again uh, by 1939. Really, really by the early 1930s, uh, whenever the Sino-Japanese War breaks out. So, make sure you answer each of those questions. At this end here, you've got an essay to write. It doesn't, I'm not looking for multiple pages here. I just want you to tell me, in your opinion, based on what you read, why senators oppose joining the league. You can list it. I mean, one of the best ways to write a thesis, in my opinion, is to have your argument List three points, or at least two points. So you you have your argument, and your argument should, should could say something like, I mean, you could restate this question with those three points. You could say the senators oppose joining the League of Nations due to, and then list your three points. And then all you have to do in the, in the paragraphs after that is back up each point with each source that you use. You've got five sources. So, like, for example, if you wanted to say that um, it was partisanship, you could say one of the reasons, just close this out. If you said that partisanship is one of the reasons, I can spell today. Then you could, you know, you point back to document C, right? That's the one that has the data that shows you the breakdown. So you say it's based on partisan lines, and I know that because, you know, 
few Republicans, according to the table, supported the uh, joining the League of Nations. And then you could also, you know, you could also just for for good measure, if you want to really build a good argument, you could throw in document B. And the fact that Henry Cabot Lodge supported the League of Nations whenever Woodrow Wilson didn't commit to supporting it one way or the other, but then he changes his mind in document A whenever he opposes it because Wilson is for it and he's a Democrat and Lodge is a Republican. So hope that everybody is staying safe. Hope you all have a good weekend. We will be having our test this week over World War One or over World War One. When we come back, we will do a review. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna be wrapping it up now, pretty quick here. So hope everybody's staying safe. As always, if you have any questions about anything, make sure you reach out to me, and I will help you in any way that I can. As soon as I can get this thing up to turn off the video. Okay, I'll talk to you guys later.